a, excuse me for leaning forward and getting real loud, I need to find my notes. Here we go. Got to make sure we have them here. You know, I just thank all the men that have uh, uh, been preaching uh, this week. I, I can't tell you the countless hours that they spend in studying and putting their messages together. And uh, I just thank all of them and, and just ask that you pray for them. Brother Tom, your message last night was phenomenal. Fifty minutes went like that. And I guess I need to turn my timer on so I don't get in trouble. Uh, yep, we're, we're on. Okay, so the countdown is on. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but I just appreciate all, all, of, all of you and uh, am very thankful uh, that uh, the message stays strong and there's faithful. You know, some shall depart from the faith. Uh, we've seen that happen. I've seen that happen in, in my local assembly. Uh, you know, our pastor are gone. So uh, I know what that's like. And Satan's doing everything he can to, uh, uh, to, to destroy this message. And yet we keep on keeping on. And, and I don't want to say this in a negative way. We might look like a bunch of misfits, you know, <laughs> when, when you look at, at the body of Christ. But yet, you know, God's working through anyone that by faith trusts in the finished work of Calvary where his son died for whose sins? All of our sins. So what I'm going to talk about today and go over with regards to my message is Christ our prize. And that's a very important topic that we understand what our prize is. If you take a look over at Philippians chapter 3, verse number 14. In Philippians 3, 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in whom? Christ Jesus. Take a look also at Philippians 3.10. That I may know him and the power of whose resurrection? Ours, his, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's his resurrection. And what we're going to do is uh, before we go through this subject, by the way, is this mic working here? Can I, can I, okay, thank you. That's a lot better. Um, can, uh, can I have you uh, take a look at a passage of Scripture in Luke? So before we kind of go through Christ our prize, I want to give uh, or just have you think about what the alternative is. So if you take a look over at Luke chapter number 16, let's all go there. In Luke chapter number 16, something quite unique here. Anybody know what a parable is? Did we lose the mic? You can hear it okay? All right. Uh, does anybody know what a parable is? What is a parable? A, a what? A story that has a meaning, but something's unique about this one right here in Luke 16. Do you know what the difference is? God's actually, and I say God, but Luke's writing this. Luke is a doctor. I, I, doctors, they're very meticulous. They're, they're smart. They've got great memories. Luke is writing here. It's, it's not just a parable, but if you take a look over at Luke 16, verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of what? Sores, okay? Wasn't a pretty sight to see Lazarus. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Poor Lazarus had the dogs licking his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died. Lazarus, and was carried by the angels into someone's bosom. Whose? Abraham's bosom, okay? The rich man also died, and he was buried. Notice he wasn't carried away by, by anybody. Uh, he, he was just buried. And in hell, the rich man, he lifted up his eyes, being in where? Torments. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he, the rich man, cried and said, Father Abraham. So what do we know about the rich man? He's a what? He's Jewish. He's Jew. So he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented where? In this flame. Does that sound good? Doesn't sound like a good place to be. 
But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And he said, the rich man, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him, Lazarus, to my father's house. Why? For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torments. So what's the rich man thinking about? His brothers, that they don't have to be where he's at. And Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. How are they going to hear them? Through the written word of God. Israel had God's word. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one of them went, did I, did I, uh, let me just start back in 29 again. And Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went up from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Interesting. Now, here's an example of where lost man is going to spend eternity. It's not a pretty sight. It is not a pretty sight. And uh, what I'd like to do is let, let, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your loving grace. I thank you for another day of grace for the lost to get saved, to trust in your son, that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins, and they put their faith in that, Lord. And Father, I pray that not only uh, the lost to get saved, but you're so clear in identifying in Timothy and to be edified and to come unto the knowledge of truth of this wonderful gospel. And Father, I thank you for your will that you've uh, continued another day of grace for us another day of peace that we have in Christ. We love you in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So this passage of Scripture in Luke 16 is giving you an example of what's happening in regards to hell, the lake of fire, and so on. Uh, hold your hand here because we're going to come back over here. Let's go over to Revelation real quick. In the book of Revelation, chapter number 20. In Revelation 20, there's uh, some. This is kind of like the finality. We're, we're getting close to the end with regards to the, the plan of God with heaven and earth. And I look forward to the day when we have, uh, you know, when God makes all things new, you know, and restores again what was once. And I just look forward to that day. And we're a part of that. We know we're a part of that when you've trusted in your Savior. So in Revelation chapter number 20, in verse number one, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Let's uh, drop down to uh, verse seven. And when the, and by the way, let's go to verse two. And he laid hold on that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him how long? Satan was bound a thousand years, okay? And, and what's crazy is Satan's going to be loosed again and mankind is going to follow after Satan. And it just, it, it just boggles my mind that Satan is, is going to be bound and he's going to be loose for a period of time. And see, now, now man can't, see, here's the key to that. Man can't blame Satan for everything because we all have an Adam, Adam, Adam. we've got Adam's nature and, and we all do. <laughs> you know, Tom was talking about his uh, grandson, you know, my, my grandson was three and a half and, and he was, uh, I said, Logan, did you eat your food? He goes, oh, yeah, Papa, I ate my food, and I'm walking over to the garbage can. And, and I'm going over, and he's running in front of me and blocking the garbage can so I wouldn't see that he spit his food out in the garbage. And I go, Logan, you lied to Papa. And you know what? Nobody taught him that. He didn't have to go to school to learn that. He just automatically had that in him. You know what? We all do. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. So, you know, I, I share that with you to let you know that you can't get, don't get mad at lost people. It's really, I mean, really? Just, just praise the Lord that we have an opportunity to, to, to possibly witness to them. And I just know, 
one of the best things, and I might offend somebody, and I apologize if I do. Did anybody get, you know, 2008 when the whole market kind of fell apart? And then, you know, some of you might have been watching all this news media and everything and getting all wound up. And, and anybody get wound up with all that drama that was going on back then? I got to tell you, I did. And I was watching this one guy on TV, and he's telling me about all this stuff that's going on with this billionaire that's doing all these things to just corrupt our, our whole society. And, you know, the best day that ever happened to me is when I turned that TV off. <laughs> and I got, you know, it was like I had to get through all that. And, you know, how many of us have a TV in our rooms? I look at that thing, and mine's just blank. I haven't even turned it. I don't even care what's happening with regards to school, I mean, not, with drama, and, you know, school shootings. It's, it's awful, terrible that, that things like that happen. We live in what kind of world? A sin-cursed world. So it is what it is. And it's not going to get better until, and, I'm, and that's what we're going to be learning about, is, is the until of who we are in Christ. Uh, but I just want to point something out here with regard to Satan. In verse 7 now, uh, in Revelation 20, verse 7. And when the thousand years expired, Satan was loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Amazing, just absolutely amazing. Verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are, and shall be what? tormented, just like that rich man. Day and night, how long? For ever and ever. Can I tell you that that rich man is still there? This was written about 2,000 years ago in Luke. He's still there. How long is he going to be there for? Eternity. We have a job to do with presenting and giving this gospel message to the lost. That's our responsibility. And I share that with you because sometimes we just get all, you know, stuck in ourselves and we're just worried and all consumed about what we're doing instead of, hey, what's God doing? And be a part of that. And I thank God for that. And will trouble and and, and tribulations and things happen while we're going out and, and doing the will of God? You bet. You fight that good fight of faith. You keep the faith. And I am so thankful that I had some individuals that kind of took me under their wing when I learned about this grace message over 20 years ago. I'm just so thankful for these men and women. The women are so critically important in the ministry. I can't begin to tell you. Um, so we, we're, we're a team. We are a team. And I just, you know, I'm just so grateful. So here we've got, we've got this, this, this information here that doesn't look very good. Let's uh, go over to Revelation chapter number uh, 21. Now, some of you are familiar with this verse in verse number 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all what? Liars in Revelation 21 verse 8. And all liars shall have their part where? And the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Does that sound good? No or no? <laughs> you don't want to be there, all right? So the thing is, my little grandson, when he lied to me, he lied. Here's a verse right here talking about all liars are going to be where? In the lake of fire. We pretty much, if, we, if we've lived long enough and you, and you learn how to, to talk and speak, you know, there's a good chance that you learn how to lie. And nobody, I mean, it's just, it's just built into us, our, 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 just, our sin-cursed nature. So let's take a look now at uh, one other passage in Revelation, and it's, it's kind of getting into the end there, that uh, verse number 21, chapter 1, excuse me, chapter 21, verse 1, and I saw what? A new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And John saw that holy city, New Jerusalem, and, and God's plan is clear. Take a look at verse 22. In verse 22, in verse 8, uh, I'm sorry, verse 22, in chapter 22, in verse 18, I testify, and John's talking now, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book, 
of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of that holy city from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, God, Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, God, when we look at the nation Israel, we've had a 2,000-year expand of time. And people look saying, wow, this period here, Paul thought, I really believe Paul thought it was going to end during his lifetime. Uh, You know, when he got... When he got uh, some additional information and he saw some things, it it rocked his world and changed his life, absolutely changed his life. And uh, and I want to go over some of this here, too, as well, real quick. And I've got to hustle because time is gone. Uh, If you take a look over, let's go back over to Luke again. And uh, get back over to Luke. And we were in 16. What I'd like to do now is go over to number... 20, chapter number 23. In Luke chapter number 23, here we we see the account of the Lord Jesus Christ in his death on the cross at Calvary. And uh, we'll just cut right to the chase in verse number 20, or chapter 23, verse number 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And he's talking to the Lord Jesus Christ is, is on the cross, and there's one on his left hand and one on his right hand. And, and one of the men, he believed that, he even said it. Take a look in verse uh, 42. And he said unto Jesus, what's that next word? Lord. You know, all the other ones that were lost, they kept calling him Master. And here, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. This guy, you know, his plight, you know, he, he knows he's going to die. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto, ye, unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And by the way, that's from like noon to 3 in, uh, p.m. So at, the, at midday, it was dark when Christ died. Just to, to, to be there, to see that, uh, the anguish that the people had that believed that he was the Messiah. Um, but there's something here in verse number 33. And when they came to the place which is called, what's that next word? Calvary. This is why I use a King James Bible. Because a lot of the other Bibles... They take that word out. Can you believe that? Calvary is not in a lot of the other Bibles. There, what do they do? They crucified him, and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And I thought, wow, isn't that something, how Satan works? You know, there's a couple of other passages of Scripture, just you know, if, you, if you want to write them down. Uh, you've got Matthew 18.11, taken up taking them right out of a lot of these other Bibles. And what is Matthew 18, 11? For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Now, who would want to try to remove that out of the Bible? Could there be a created being? No, absolutely. Satan. Another one. Romans 16, 24. And Paul's epistles, that one's taken out of a lot of the Bibles. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, who would want to get rid of the grace? Hmm. Interesting. And the one that got me, the, the number one, don't mess with the blood, Colossians 1.14. And Colossians 1.14, that verse is there, but you know what a lot of the Bibles do? They remove through his blood. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And a lot of these other Bibles, they go, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sin. Let me tell you something, saints. It is the blood. It is the blood, that perfect blood. The Lord Jesus Christ shedding his perfect blood on Calvary's cross. It's so critically important for salvation. It's so critically important. So I just wanted to share that with regards to the word of God and why it's so important and why you can know for absolute certainty by having a KJV. Now, if somebody's going to use another Bible, I'm not going to put you under any law that you've got to change. I don't want to do that. That's not my role to do that. I'd educate you on it and encourage you to use the King James. But whose choice is it ultimately? The individual. Whose choice is it ultimately to get saved? The individual. So, hmm. Now, let's, 
Let's uh, just recap something real quick. Uh, with Brother Ed, when he was uh, going over Philippians 1, Christ our purpose, uh, you know, what, a couple of key factors there was being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun in verse 16, Philippians 1, 16, if you want to read along. Being confident of the very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until when? The day of Christ. And that good work our Lord and Savior is doing. In Philippians 1, 9, this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Verse 10, that ye may be approved, that ye may approve the things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. In verse 21, for to me to live is what? Christ, and to die is gain. Amen. And uh, the recap with uh, Brother Charlie, what a wonderful message he did as well. In Philippians chapter number 2, uh, verse number 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be uh, equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. In verse 8, uh, uh, Philippians 2, 8, And being found in the fashion as a man, what did he do, the Lord Jesus Christ? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, I can tell you for absolute certainty, I have seen saints here that are humble. I have seen saints here that have been attacked by other individuals, that have been attacked by other, unfortunately, grace people. And I've seen those that have the, the, the love of Christ that indwells them. They're not going like this. They, they, even, they even look weak because they're not going to rebel back and start getting into this jostling fight back and forth. I thank God for those people that are saints that have the right heart and they're humble. Because I got to tell you, my old sin-cursed nature, my, my pride, you know, I would you know, snap like that. And just, you know, you know, and I know there's other people in here that would probably do the same thing. And, and what I'm learning in grace is that there's a relationship with my Savior, and I don't have to snap back anymore. And uh, no, the, the marriage message that we had yesterday, what a wonderful message that was. And, you know, unfortunately in a relationship, sometimes people, they snap back, husband and wife. Or I'm probably the only one that's ever done that. <laughs> no, I, you know, uh, but, but, that, but, see, but here we have the opportunity to grow. We have the opportunity to grow. Um, so, so we've got this mind being in us. We're fashioned like unto the Lord Jesus Christ. So, and being found in the fashion as a man, the Lord Jesus Christ, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And then Philippians 2.15, which is so important, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as what? Lights in the world. See, Satan... He's got a light as well. That's a light that's going to go out. We as members of the body of Christ, we also have a light that will shine throughout all of eternity. And I thank God for that. And in Philippians 3, my topic is uh, regarding the Apostle Paul writing to the Philippians and if we take a look at Philippians chapter number 1, verse 1, let's get there. I'm sorry, 3, 1. In Philippians 3, 1. Finally, my brethren, what does it say? Rejoice where? In the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. I am so thankful that we can rejoice in the Lord. I don't care how terrible, how rough your life gets, whether it's physical infirmities, whether it's financial infirmities, whether it's marriage relation infirmities, that we can rejoice in the Lord and get through those issues. And I thank God for that. I thank God for that because we all have stuff happening in our life. Uh, take a look over at uh, Philippians chapter number 3, verse number 4. For though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man think that he hath whereof, uh, he might trust in the flesh. Paul's going to give his pedigree now. I more. So what do we know about Paul? 
He's going to give it to us. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee. Oh, yeah. Right? Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I count what? Loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, in verse 8, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss. Why? For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. Why? That I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness. Oh, our old sin-cursed nature, our old righteousness is what in God's eyes? Filthy rags, which is of the law, but that which is... Uh, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So again, verse 9, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. We live long enough. Are we going to have sufferings? You betcha. You betcha. You know, I, there's some stuff going around with regards to suffering today and, and, and you know, so, some conversation about that. Can I tell you, the sufferings of this world, it's, it's part of life. But you've got to be careful because I think you can have actually two people doing a work. One's doing it in the spirit of Almighty God by faith. One's doing it in their flesh. But they're both doing the same work. If both individuals are saved, one of them's going to be a reward, one's going to burn. Okay? We're going to find out when we get there at the judgment seat of Christ. And I don't worry about that stuff. Just, just, I, I just don't worry about it. Um, I've got people, uh, uh, Russellites, you know, you know, people that come over knocking on the door. I love when they come knocking on the door. I'm actually grabbing my Bible, and I'm running at the front door. My wife's like, oh, not again, Ron. You know, but, I, I, hey, I want to show them. Verses in their Bible where they can see Christ is God. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. Well, they'll deny that like crazy, but yet I show them verses and they're like, oh, and they don't know how to handle it. You know, and it's just, so, so I, I take opportunity to that. But you know what? Every time that they get into a, a discussion, a jousting dialogue back and forth with somebody, you know what they're doing? They're proud because they're suffering for Jehovah. But you gotta, you got to watch out for that because there's, there's this suffering that can be in your flesh. And that suffering that comes from your flesh, I'm telling you, it can trick you. It can trick you. So you've got to be careful with those things. And, and I understand what some of the brothers are talking about uh, with regards to the suffering. And I just you know, I praise the Lord that we have the Word of God that can help guide us. And uh, I just, I'm thankful for all the saints. Even the ones that sometimes get in the flesh. Um, do, you even, do you know a lost person can actually lead someone to Christ? If somebody had a track and they're lost, they're like, you know what, I don't want this, and they give it to their friend. And their friend reads the track and gets saved. Isn't that amazing how God works? Can somebody get saved by just looking at a track and reading a track? Yeah. You, yeah. So I just... Fascinating, absolutely fascinating how God works. So be in the Word. <laughs> That's number one. Very important to be in the Word. Read the Word of God. Give attendance to, to reading daily, just daily reading your Word. I remember one of the things Brother Jordan shared with me. He goes, Ron, one of the things I learned when I got into the ministry, I made a decision that I was going to work a minimum of 20 hours a week studying that Bible. I thought, 20 hours a week? Yeah. Maybe that's why he, he helped Rodney with connecting a lot more things. When, when he was looking, and thought, man, I got it. And all of a sudden, you go through grace school of the Bible. It's like, whoa, I had no clue what I didn't know. I thank God for faithful men. And here's the nice thing, that you'll be able to teach others also because you've got this doctrine inside you now, not just here. You get the doctrine here. I'm telling you, it's 18 inches between being lost and saved. It's, you, know, you can have it intellectually here, but then when you get it here in the heart, it transforms you. Be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Thank God for that. 
Let's continue on. In Philippians 11, or 3, 11, um, we'll go back to verse 10, 3, 10. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Paul's looking at his pedigree, and he calls it all but dung. He says, put it behind me. Focus on the task now. Focus on the task at hand. What does he do in verse 14? He says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's, that, that's, that, that's the message, the topic of this. Christ our what? Our prize. Christ our prize, that we may know him and the power of his resurrection. In verse 15, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be follows together of me, whom? Paul. And mark them which walk so after you have us for an example. Mark those people. Know who the faithful are. And, you know, mark those that you know you don't want to be spending time with. (laughs) Mark those that need edification. Now, the Apostle Paul had something very unique happen to him. If we could take a look over at 2 Corinthians He had something that absolutely changed his life. It rocked his world. If you take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, in verse number 1, it is therefore expedient for me, doubtless, and again, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, it is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations. How many, by the way, John, when he wrote the book, the last book there, the book of Revelation, is there an S at the end? No, so he just got one. The Apostle Paul, what did he get from the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ? Revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to where? The third heaven. When I was a kid growing up in church, I didn't know anything about a third heaven, never even heard it. When I started reading my KJV and learning God's word rightly divided, it's like, I'll be, there's a third heaven. We got the atmosphere the, where the birdies fly. That's the first heaven. We've got space, outer space, and, and the, the stars, the moon, and all the planets. And that's the second heaven. And then you got the third heaven. To be absent from the body is to be where? Present with the Lord. I believe in the third heaven. And I know that there are saints that I've met the past 20 plus years in this ministry that have gone to be with the Lord. Men and women, given their life, for this message, and I thank God for that, and I thank God that it's a graduation. Brother Oscar Woodall, he used to tell me, Ron, when somebody passes away, don't, don't. it's a graduation. It's a graduation. What a way to think of it. Boy, I mean, death, you know, it hurts. It hurts when you lose somebody you love, but when you think about the graduation, oh, what, what, a, what a nice way to, to, to regenerate that mind. I, I know there's a grieving process, but boy, what a, what a loving joy to know that you'll be with those. Uh, we had some children in our local assembly that died. That hurt, oh, it hurts, but there's a graduation. Paul, he says, I cannot tell her whether out of the body I can now tell God knows such one caught up to the third heaven. In verse 3, and I knew such a man whether in the body or out of the body I can now tell God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise. He was caught where? Up into paradise. Before in Abraham's bosom, where were they? Down in the center of the earth area. Up in the paradise, and I heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my what? Infirmities. Though I would, though I, for though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, 
For I will say the truth, but now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in what? Meekness. That's why this, you know, getting all proud and puffed up in the grace message, I don't see that as a good thing. God says we're made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power may be of whom? Christ. And Christ may what? Rest upon us. For I take pleasure in the infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am what? Strong. So it, it's like a dichotomy. It's, it's like it's the exact opposite of what you would think. In the flesh, you would think it would be, you know, charge, go get them. But in the dispensation of grace, as a member of the body of Christ, you're made perfect in weakness. But don't think that weakness is... is not a value. That weakness is extremely important. When Christ came, did he come in this, this glory and, and, and like the, the King of kings and Lord of lords and what that Israel was expecting? No, he came as a little babe. He came as a little babe. There is going to come a day. Here come the judge. Anybody remember Flip Wilson back years and years ago? There, there, the judge is going to come one day. He's going to be riding on a horse and it ain't going to be good. But you've got to be careful with that horse because Satan's also riding on a horse as well. So that counterfeiter, he's amazing how he counterfeits things. He's the master counterfeiter. Boy, all these different Bibles out there, you know, counterfeit. People get mad at me for saying that possibly. But when you have every word in the Bible, when you've got the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ there in Colossians 1.14, now you got something. Let's take a look over at uh, Romans chapter 5, verse number 1. And if Christ, um, in verse, uh, Romans 5, 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have what with God? Peace with God, through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access. That's what I like. We have access by faith into this grace where we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have access. Do you know that we can pray to God the Father? We have access to him. We have a mediator between us and God. Isn't that wonderful? We've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Not only are we, in, you know, I thought about, who was, who was talking about the babies? In, oh, Tom, uh, last night with the, with the babies. Wasn't that cute, that uh, little thing that they had on the back of the bulletin? And, and they were talking about the, you know, the, the babies and, and so on. No, I lost my train of thought. Ah, oh, you get in your 50s, it starts going down. Oh. All right, there, there was a whole thing I wanted to say about that, and I, I, I just, it skips my mind now. Um, but the, the praise of the Lord that we have access by faith into the grace and, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Um, and you know what? I'm trying to remember it, and I just, it's like, I'll remember it when we're done, and I'm walking, I'm going up the elevator. There it is. All right. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. In verse number 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also do what? Quicken, be made alive, quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that where? dwelleth in you, God, the Holy Spirit. So not only are we praying to God inwardly, we're praying outward. That was it. Being in the womb and out of the womb and what that was like. And, you know, and, 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 I, and I was thinking about that you know, with regards to our relationship that we have in Christ. God's in us, and yet God's out there. And, you know, it's kind of and it's like those kids in the womb. You know, oh, what's it going to be like when we get out there and so on? And... Uh, I think I, you know, my parents, they made me when they were 17. Everybody said, don't, you know, adopt, just get rid of the baby. That was me. 
And I thank God my parents didn't listen to the, you know, the priests and, the, and the, the wisdom. As a matter of fact, my parents have been married for over 50 years. They're, they've outmarried a lot of their other friends. And they were just young, you know, 17, 18-year-old kids starting a family. And I've shared the gospel to my family. I love my family. I really do. And I've given the gospel to them. That's all I can do. <laughs> I would love for them. I, I, I invited them all to be here at 7 o'clock. And, uh, but you know what? You're here. Praise the God for that. You're here. And I thank God for that. Because we can't force someone to get saved. Last time I checked, we can't force someone to get saved. It's a faith issue. So, so let's uh, continue on here. Galatians. Oh, oh, did I give you Romans 8, 10, right? So Galatians 2, 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I what? Live. Yet not I, but who? Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's wonderful. You're crucified with Christ. What does that mean? Spiritually, you're dead on the cross. You're dead. Your old sin, cursed nature is flat out, bottom line, dead. We keep trying to resurrect it again, getting in that flesh, but it's, it's dead. Oh, I'm so thankful it's dead. Repeat, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So now you're living in the Spirit. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of myself. No, that's what Paul called dung with all of his self-righteousness stuff. By the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. Paul's talking to the Galatians, and they're having some, some issues. And Paul mentions, my little children, of whom I travail and birth again until what? Christ be formed where? In you. And in Colossians, uh, if we go to over to Colossians, I tried to keep these real close together and try to put them in order so I don't have to keep going back for it, back for it. Colossians chapter number one. To whom God, to whom God would make known in Colossians 1.27. Sorry if I didn't say that right. Colossians 1.27, in whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm so thankful for that. Not only is it Christ in us, it's God the Holy Spirit in us. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse number 6. And I'll just read these if you want to write these down because I've only got eight minutes left. Um, in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, For we know that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Oh, there's so much into being that temple of Almighty God. In uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. The Apostle Paul, mm, he talks about that. He says in 2 Timothy 4, 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Who's appearing? Hmm? Our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. When he comes down and he calls that body of Christ, I am looking forward to that day. And that cloud, you know, when Morris Chestnut was talking, anybody hear Morris talk? I never thought about that whole thing with the meats he was referring to. I kind of thought of Catholicism. You know, you're not supposed to eat meat or, and, you know, you can't, no marrying because the priests don't marry and they don't eat meat on Fridays. You know, they eat fish. Is, it, is fish a meat? I would imagine, but, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. But when, 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 um, when, when um, Morris was talking about that, I was like, wow, isn't that interesting? That, you know, this, this planet might reframe it and, and put down meat. You know, when, the, uh, when we had the different dispensations with food, what, the last one was, you can eat me. Hey, if you can catch it, you can eat it. You know, I think there's something happened with the atmosphere. I'm not sure exactly what took place. But after that flood, it seemed like, you know, things changed. You know, uh, grapes that were eaten became fermented and wine. Things changed. And um, so, you know, for, again, the same thing, mine. I thank God I have the mind of Christ in me. That can't fail me. But this mind in the flesh, I'm telling you, when you get older, it goes. 
Um, so, but but we're we all. It, The power of Almighty God, God the Holy Spirit indwelling us. These are all very important things. Um, I, I'm just going to give some of these other verses. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. I am so thankful for that. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, We are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that done, whether it be good or bad. In 2 Corinthians 5.11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. A couple of other uh, real quick here uh, with regards to the uh, constraining that we have. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we ju- thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all what? Dead. And that he that died for all, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And that's what we're doing as members of the body of Christ. We're living for him, our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're living for that message of grace to see the lost saved and the saints edified. In 2 Corinthians 5, 16, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth, know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, now then, we are ambassadors. You and I, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, you are an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ambassadors, they reside on foreign lands. We are in a foreign land. We are resi- we're not here. This is not our home. Okay? So now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. In verse 21, for he, God, hath made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may, might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the Trinity right there. That cross work is so important. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness in 1 Corinthians 1.18. But unto us which is our saved, it is the power of God. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through his blood. Uh, by the way, and, and having peace through the blood of whose cross? His cross. In Colossians 1.20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Let me tell you something, saints. It's not Rome's cross. It's the Lord Jesus Christ's cross. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And I'm getting to all of this to get to this point. And I've got two minutes and 23 seconds. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Ephesians 2 10. For we are his workmanship. His who? The Lord Jesus Christ, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Again, I'm going to repeat it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Must is a directive. Should is an obligation. You have an obligation that we are to walk in them. And when you do this, something very unique happens. Take a look at 2 Corinthians. Hold your hands there at Ephesians 2.10. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10.3. For though we walk in the flesh, in 2 Corinthians 10.3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So these weapons are not physical 
weapons with ammunition where people are killing everybody in the flesh. This is different. Verse 10, or sorry, verse 5, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That is key. I can't tell you how critically important that is. When you have an issue, you bring it unto Christ. Bring it to the cross. When you have a problem, bring it to the cross. When you have a, a marriage relationship that's going through shambles, bring it to the cross. When you don't understand something about the Word of God rightly divided, bring it to the cross. It's that cross. Whose obedience is it? It's Christ's obedience. Let me read that again. Verse uh, 10. I got to shut this off because we're getting ready to. Oh, look at that. How you like that? All right. 2 Corinthians 10 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. That doesn't sound very good, does it? And now, and bring into captivity every thought to what? The obedience of Christ. Bring into captivity every what? Thought to the obedience of Christ. When you do that, now you can go back to Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus on the good works, which God hath before ordained that we what? We should walk in them. We're walking in these good works. We have a, a confrontation going on. You know what, Lord? I'm bringing it to the cross. I'm going to let you handle it. Do you know why? So I don't have to be in the flesh and get all bent up and wound up and out of shape and everything because now I'm in my flesh. That's not the will of God. God's will is to have us walking in the Spirit. And when we can bring it to the cross of Almighty Calvary, it's this cross. This is Christ's cross. I'm so thankful for that. And I thank God that this dispensation of grace is going on for two years thousand years. A lot of people ask me, Ron, why do bad things happen? I go, what a great question. God's extending another day of grace for the lost to get saved and the saints edified. So no matter what kind of troubles and trials and tribulations we have, until the body of Christ is caught up out of here, God's extending another day of grace for the lost to get saved and the saints edified because the one day that last person is going to be saved. And that last person that gets saved, they're going to have it all too. And I look forward to being in the heavenly realm with you. I look forward to the opportunity to hear stories about how you've given that gospel to so many people that it, it brings joy in, its, in your heart and a tear in your eye to know that you've seen individuals that were destined like that rich man to spend eternity and he's still there after 2,000 years. He's going to be there throughout all of eternity that we can help people go from death and hell and the lake of fire unto eternal life. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving grace. And Father, I thank you for your message. And I pray that it has an impact on individual souls. And for those that may be listening to this message years from now, and, and the body of Christ is still here on this planet, Father, I pray that they give consideration to that rich man and where he's at, and don't spend eternity. I mean, I pray for people... To, to just simply trust in the shed blood, the perfect blood of our Lord and Savior, that you can know for absolute certainty you have the free gift of eternal life. And Father, I, I just don't want to see anybody go to hell, and I know you don't either. But yet, you give us the volition to choose, and I thank God that we chose you. We love you in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen.